It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Megan Miller, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the Mind Institute at UC Davis. I'm not going to read all your stuff, Megan, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's the end of the day. And Megan's going to talk to us about some of her research on siblings of children with autism and other topics from the Mind Institute. Dr. Miller. Well, thank you very much for um, having me here today. Um, I'm going to be kind of doing, I'm going to be shifting gears a little bit, I guess, from what you've been talking about so far um, and spending some time talking about autism and also talking about very young kids all the way up through uh, adolescence and adulthood. I have nothing to disclose. Um, in terms of an overview, I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, actually not about some of my research at the beginning. I'm going to spend a little time just to tell you about some of the work that's going on at the Mind Institute that I'm not involved in, but I think you might have interest in. Then I'll talk about um, what we've learned about early detection of autism by studying younger siblings of children with autism, talk a little bit about longer term outcomes of these younger siblings of children with autism in school age, which is some work that I've been involved with with Sally Ozanoff at the Mind Institute, and also into adulthood, which is work by um, some other folks not at the Mind Institute. And then I think after the Kegels talk, we'll have some time for questions. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about the Mind Institute, if people aren't familiar, um, it was founded by six families of children with autism. And the research and assessment clinics opened in the late 90s, so it's been around for about 20 years now. Um, and in name, but the complex, the building itself, was built in 2003. Uh, and we have a number of clinical and research projects going on at the Mind Institute, spanning a lot of different areas, uh, including um, research on using brain imaging, so findings about boys with autism who experience regression, having larger brain sizes, um, studies looking at risk factors and protective factors, like the use of folic acid um, taken preconception or prenatally and that being related to um, decreasing risk for autism. There are studies of animal models of neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about studies focused on early markers of autism. There are other folks at the mine, of course, that are studying early interventions for autism as well. And I'll talk about two um, center grant projects that have recently been awarded to the Mind Institute um, from the National Institutes of Health. These are Autism Centers of Excellence, or ACE, awards. Um, and the first one is led by Dr. David Amaral, and it's focused on two subgroups of children with autism. So one is children with autism who also experience significant anxiety and trying to understand better how do we identify that, how do we diagnose it, um, how do we treat it, so combined treatment study of cognitive behavioral therapy and medication. They're also going to be looking at brain imaging and whether there are brain changes in response to treatment. And then the other subgroup they're focused on is the group of children with autism who also have larger brains. Um, and this is really kind of a basic science project where they're going to be um, trying to determine which brain systems are affected. They're going to use stem cells to grow neurons, um, to identify genetic changes that might be related to enlarged brains. Um, so it's kind of a combination of a clinical and a basic science project. And then the other one I'm going to spend a little more time to tell you about, mostly because I'm really excited about it. I'm not involved in this, but it's led by Aubin Stamer. Um, and this is focused on kind of the combined effort to identify symptoms early, but also to intervene early. Um, and there's good evidence at this point, which I'll tell you a bit more, more about later, that screening early can detect autism earlier, um, and that harm, the harm from screening early is likely to be small. But uh, there was this paper that came out from the US Preventive Services Task Force suggesting actually or concluding that there is inadequate evidence at this point that it has benefits, uh, that earlier intervention necessarily has longer term benefits or that, it, that early detection has longer term benefits when it comes to early intervention. Um, there's a lack of research studies that are focused on um, treating 
cases of children who have been identified by early screening. And so this is a really big limitation in try, trying to understand that pipeline of early detection to early intervention and how that impacts outcomes. So that's what this particular ACE project is trying to address, this pipeline of early screening to um, early intervention and, and improving outcomes over time. And this is a busy slide but just to give you a sense of what this study looks like, they're actually intervening um, firstly on providers. So they're assigning providers to um, either screening in a standardized way, uh, routine surveillance, or just as usual how their practice does autism screening at early in the first three years of life. And then they're um, taking the screen positive cases and doing early intervention, early start Denver model with these cases and looking at various outcomes. Um, so the screening is universal. They're screening all children, at eight, the 18-month checkup in the intervention group, um, meaning they're intervening on the providers and training them how to do this. They're standardized, so they're screening the same way using the MCHAT. Um, and it's high fidelity, so their goal is to avoid all the common errors, to encourage all screen positive families to attend a fuller evaluation and um, potentially uh, into their treatment. Um, so what they do after there's a positive screen or there's provider concerns, they'll do an evaluation. If, if it's determined that, yes, this child has autism, they'll do a year of intensive treatment, and then they'll document their progress a year later to see if this really standardized, high-fidelity way of doing early screening uh, has a higher probability of getting kids into early intervention and a higher probability of improved outcomes. We also have some clinics at the Mind Institute related to assessment and diagnosis of various neurodevelopmental disorders, social skills programs. Um, so the big focus at the Mind has been autism, but we also um, have research and clinical services related to ADHD, um, genetic syndromes, and so on. And then we also have some educational and outreach um, programs, um, a Centers of Excellence for Developmental Disabilities. We have a postdoctoral training program, the Autism Research Training Program, and um, we're a LEND site, Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disorders as well. And then also have a Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics Fellowship Program. So now I'm gonna move into talking a bit about um, early detection of ASD. Um, and I've sort of alluded to this already, but one of the first questions is why? Why do we care about early detection? Um, and the idea is that we think that early identification will result in earlier treatment and hopefully improved outcomes. Now that ACE project led by Dr. Stamer will hopefully prove that that's truly correct um, and provide us really solid evidence of that, but um, that's a, a, you know, a strong, strongly held belief in the field and probably true. Um, but more broadly, it could also have, the, have an impact on decreasing service utilization costs and kind of the economic burden more broadly. One of the big challenges um, related to early detection or one of the critiques people might have is the risk of false positives. So identifying a child as having autism, referring for treatment, but in fact they, we were wrong, they didn't have autism and they were just really young. Um, but in general, uh, you know, the interventions that are commonly used, um, we tend to think that the, the benefits likely outweigh um, that, that negative. And really focusing on infancy and early childhood is a really, it's a great time period to try to understand how these um, conditions develop because, and to help with uh, improving accurate earlier detection, identifying the time periods that are most important for identification and maybe early intervention, um, and what areas of functioning are the most relevant in this developmental period that might uh, you know, help us identify autism earlier. Um, so the next question is how do we do it? And what I'm gonna tell you about is one particular study design that gets used to try to identify early signs of autism. And this is um, focused on siblings. So uh, it's called an infant sibling study design. And what we do is we um, study families. So we have the parents here and then they have a child with autism and then the family has a baby. And this baby's considered to be an elevated risk for autism based on family history, genetics. Um, so we know the recurrence rate of autism in younger siblings of children with autism is significantly higher than the rate in the general population. Um, and then we have our comparison group of babies who have only typically developing older siblings, no family history of autism spectrum disorder. 
And then we have them come into the lab for um, assessments at regular intervals in the first several years of life. So they will come in at 6, 9, 12, you know, 15, 18, 24, and 36 months of life, and we'll do a whole um, range of assessments with them, developmental assessments. Um, we'll do some eye tracking assessments to see kind of what they focus on and are interested in. Um, parents will fill out a variety of questionnaires. Um, starting at 18 months, we'll do an ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Scale. And then when they turn three, we'll determine which babies went on, had developed autism by age three, and which babies uh, ended up being typically developing. And then we can go back and look at all of the data and see where did the differences between those groups of children begin to emerge, and in what areas of functioning. So. Um, I'll just say that if a child meets criteria before age three, we will certainly make the diagnosis and, and provide referrals and recommendations. But kind of the final determination for the study is age three. Um, interesting, I think, you know, excitingly, um, Sally Ozanoff has gotten a follow-up grant to study cohorts of these babies into school, school age period. So now they're some, it's between seven and 14, and we're seeing them back um, to see how they're functioning later in development, whether they developed autism or not, so all of them. So in terms of what we're learning from siblings in the infancy period, um, we're learning about the recurrence risk for autism, we're learning about how symptoms emerge and onset, what are the early markers. I'm not gonna talk about biological markers, but some studies using this study design do study, um, you know, they do brain scans and, or EEG. Uh, I'll talk a bit about some of the behavioral markers. Um, and then we can learn more about targets for prevention and intervention programs. So in terms of recurrence risk, um, previously it was thought that about three to 10% of younger siblings of children with autism would develop autism themselves, which was significantly higher than the population prevalence. But through these infant sibling study designs, there's a consortium across the globe, really, with multiple um, investigators involved called the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, and they've pooled their data. They all sort of follow this study design to, to answer this question of what's the updated recurrence rate in, in these samples that we get from these types of studies. And it's much closer to 20%, at least in these infant sibling samples that we've studied, which is significantly higher than, than we thought and certainly significantly higher than the general population prevalence of about 1.5%, as was referenced earlier. Um, so that, that has some implications, I think, about kind of what families are thinking about, and, and you know, I think it's helpful to know. Um, you know, just so you can monitor and watch for early signs. Um, in terms of those early signs, in terms of early behavioral markers that we might be looking for, especially thinking about the symptoms of autism, social communication challenges, and then also thinking about infancy or early childhood, we're really looking for things like differences in eye gaze, differences in frequencies of vocalizations, smiling or sharing their affect with other people, responding to their name. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of data about each of these things that we've collected through these studies. And this data was collected in, uh, through Sally Ozanoff's infant sibling studies. Um, and this was a paper she published back in 2010 um, where they collected uh, the data on these babies between six and 36 months of age, and they video recorded all of the assessments, and then they had people who were trained up to really high fidelity and reliability to code very specific behaviors that they saw in the videos, things like um, eye contact or gazing to the face of the other person in the, in the video, or um, directing their smiles to the other person, or vocalizing. And what you can see is this, this group in red is the group who went on to be diagnosed with ASD by age three. And you can see that in these basic building block social communication behaviors, you see declining trajectories or sort of low, flat trajectories in the group who went on to develop autism. And the differences really begin to emerge between 12 and 18 months of age, where we see these changes happening. Um, what I think is really interesting, and especially for clinicians, is that when we asked clinicians to rate very similar behaviors after they assessed the child, and, with, and these are blind examiners, they don't know anything about the family history, they don't know whether they're at risk for autism or not at risk for autism, you see a really similar pattern, these declining trajectories of the examiner or expert kind of 
clinician ratings, with the differences really becoming most different between 12 and 18 months. So I think we can kind of get at the same thing that this painstaking really takes a long time to do this coding. We can get at the same thing from the clinician ratings. In terms of um, another social behavior that we've noticed uh, is different in um, infants who are going on to develop autism, uh, it's response to names. So we know that infants use their names as social cues, which helps them to orient to salient aspects of their environment, including social partners. Um, and uh, what what has been shown in the past is that there has been a diminishment in the response to name by about 12 months of age, and this was found uh, in, in babies who developed autism, but this was found um, using retrospective chart review um, or uh, uh, videos, basically, or paper, paper pencil measures that parents fill out. And so we really wanted to look at this from um, our prospectively collected data and um, kind of over time, so the developmental progression of responding to name. And what we found, uh, so we used a measure from um, uh, it's the AOC, it's a task that, this is an item from that task that, um, where the examiner calls the baby's name up to two times, and there are two trials like that, so up to four total times at different intervals during the assessment. Um, and we were pretty stringent in our definition of a failure, so this, to fail, we, we said that they had to not respond on any of the four trials. Um, and what we found was that the group who went on to develop autism was more likely to fail by nine months of age and persisting th through 24 months of age. So this, this appears to be distinguishing that group as early as nine months of age. So ultimately, I think this work focused on infants at risk for autism has kind of resulted in a lot of um, important information for clinical practice, and I think that it has made its way into clinical practice uh, related to red flags and early screening for autism in the first couple of years of life. So I think families know a lot more because they've heard a lot more about this, um, these early signs, they're, they're watching for it. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has implemented kind of regular or universal screening uh, at specific intervals with recommended measures uh, early in life. Um, so I think it has some, clin uh, some significant clinical impact thus far. Now I mentioned earlier that about 20, just under 20% of these infant siblings go on to develop autism by age three. But, so if you do your math, that means most of them don't, right? So there's a question about what about all of these other children who are, were at risk but didn't, did not develop autism? And so we've been interested in this concept of the broader autism phenotype, so sort of non-diagnostic, subclinical, more like traits or characteristics that are kind of in line with autism spectrum disorder, so subthreshold social communication challenges, for example, um, but that are not at the clinical level. And we see this sometimes in family members of individuals with autism. And we were interested in trying to understand how early can we identify those subclinical differences. Um, so what we did was we characterized our sample of, of these babies at, when they were three, it, whether they were typically developing or non-typically developing based on their Mullen standardized developmental scores and or ADOS scores being within several points of the autism cutoff. Um, and then looked backward to see where did, they, where did that group of children start to differ from the children who were typically developing. And the answer was around 12 months of age um, that we saw differences. So again, we can see differences in this, this um, these children who are experiencing subthreshold challenges even earlier than uh, kind of we expected. So now the question is, that's up to age three, and there's been a lot of work across all of these baby siblings consortium sites to study these infant siblings up to age three, but then it's sort of stopped. Um, and of course, we all know that children continue to develop, and that's one of the reasons that we've been interested in, Sally Ozanoff has been interested in understanding some of the longer-term outcomes of these siblings beyond the preschool period. Um, and um, again, 80% of younger siblings don't develop autism, but are there risks for other things that come along later in life? Um, that's a question that's, you know, worth answering. Um, and the answer is generally yes. So about 35% we found of children develop some other non ASD concerns by school age. That doesn't mean diagnosable, but um, some level of concern across a variety of different measures. So I'll give you some examples. 
This was sort of a pilot um, project that um, was looking at one cohort of these baby siblings when they were six to eight years of age. So they had grown up into that early school age period. Um, and what we found here was kind of, when we looked at it different ways, we kind of found the same thing, um, whether we were looking at clinical concerns as expressed by a clinician who assessed the child, or um, scores above a clinical cutoff on measures of psychopathology symptoms like depression, anxiety, or um, autism-related symptoms, or language scores on standardized language testing, we see a higher proportion of the group who has a family history of autism falling into that impaired or concerning range. And these are the children who do not have autism themselves. Um, so like I said, anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of the siblings were falling into these sort of elevated or clinical concerns ranges. Now one of the things that was coming up in that age range a lot for us was um, concerns about ADHD. And um, so we did another sort of smaller pilot where we looked at 8 to 11 years of age and really tried to do a better job of characterizing ADHD. Um, and I think there are some caveats I would mention here, uh, you can see uh, a pretty high rate of ADHD in our low risk group. Um, so it's certainly possible that the families who are most concerned are the ones who came back really easily. Um, but there is a difference in terms of, you know, the, the group that had a family history of autism had significantly higher rates of ADHD than our low risk group. So that kind of piqued our interest. Um, and led to the current follow-up um, that we're doing uh, a little bit older, um, 12 to 15 years of age for most of the children. Uh, some of them may come in a little earlier than that, maybe eight to 15 in the end, um, across three different cohorts that had been recruited over the last 15 years or so. Um, and we're doing a more comprehensive assessment of symptoms of psychopathology like ADHD, anxiety, mood concerns. Um, so we're doing a full diagnostic workup on, on those things. We're also assessing academic skills, um, pragmatic language abilities, which we know are um, challenging for children with autism, but also there's suggestion that it may be an area that's a little bit challenging for siblings who don't have autism. We're kind of doing a deep dive into their attention skills, their activity level, their ability to, to control their inhib inhibitions or, or kind of responses, to inhibit their responses. Um, and then lastly, I think really importantly, their peer relationships and social functioning. So we're having teachers fill out ratings about how well the child is liked and how, how you know, what their social skills are like, how many friends they have, those kinds of things. Um, and one of the reasons we're really interested in, in doing this is because we want to understand how siblings are functioning later in development, but we also see these higher rates of uh, other um, kind of concerns outcomes in this population. And so our thinking is that we might be able, by following them up, to um, use the data that we've been collecting for the last 15 years, for their whole lives really, to predict other non-autism outcomes. like. What might be early markers of ADHD? What might be early markers of anxiety in these siblings? Um, so I don't know if we'll get to adulthood following these same cohorts, but there have been certainly studies of adult siblings of children with autism. This is not work that we've done ourselves, but there was um, a study a few years back by Howland et al. where they looked at 87 adult siblings of children with autism. Um, the average age was just under 40. And these, they had a group within this group of siblings, a subgroup that had been previously evaluated at a prior time point and um, identified as either broader, having that, that kind of broader autism phenotype traits, some sub-threshold um, uh, symptoms or, or traits, characteristics, or unaffected um, or typically developing. Um, and when they followed them up at this adult time point, what they found was that the, unaffect, the previously determined or defined unaffected group had average intellectual functioning, ac basic academic skills, they were functioning really well in jobs, in their independence, and in their social relationships. So they were, you know, just functioning average. 
or above average. Um, the group that had been previously identified as having some of these sub-threshold characteristics had some challenges with employment. Um, they had lower social relationship levels, um, and they had elevated ASD traits, as would be expected, as well as elevated um, rates of other mental health symptoms. So this is, um, I hope you, you can see, I think you can see it relatively well, but this, the group in pink is that group that had the sub-threshold sub autism traits at an earlier age. And what you can see here is that they're, they're elevated across uh, several different um, aspects of functioning, so OCD symptoms, um, uh, depre so episodic depression symptoms um, was the same, but chronic depression symptoms was different, higher levels of anxiety, um, and higher rates of being above a clinical threshold for ADHD. And these were symptoms here that actually had to, re they required treatment. So this was significantly elevated symptoms. So there do seem to be some concerns that persist across the lifespan for a subset of siblings of children with autism who don't have autism themselves. So just to summarize here, um, I would say that we've made a lot of progress by studying siblings in the early detection of autism spectrum disorder that I do think have clear implications for clinical practice, especially for those of us who are working in the early intervention, early identification world, the birth to three uh, world. And I think as a result of studying these baby siblings, we're realizing that there's a really big gap here that we really don't know about longer term outcomes. We've sort of just kind of cut them off at three and then moved on, but we have this opportunity to really um, understand uh, the full developmental life course um, by continuing to follow up these siblings who have truly been enrolled in these studies since they were since, since the beginning of their lives, um, which is pretty amazing. And this could help us really understand early predictors of other outcomes later in life, like ADHD, for example. Um, I think the other thing we really need to do more of is try to understand resilience and protective factors. And I think these studies, these samples, really provide an opportunity for that as well. Um, and so I think we'll probably start to see more of that over the next few years. I just want to put a plug out, um, because we're not too far from the Mind Institute, um, for a study that I'm currently doing, and we have lots of families who enroll from the Bay Area, um, but if you have any clients or, or patients or know any families who might be interested um, in this type of work where we do kind of regular close monitoring of, of the baby's development, um, we're recruiting babies, um, and we're doing an inner, uh, infant sibling study that's kind of combined across autism risk and ADHD. So we're also studying babies at risk for ADHD to see if we can apply the same methods that have been so useful in autism to identifying some early markers of ADHD as well. Um, so there's information there if you're, you're interested. So I'd just like to thank um, the Early Risk uh, Study Lab, which is my lab, and the Infant Sibling Study, which is Sally Ozanoff's study. Um, a lot of the data that I shared with you today is from her research um, that I have just been fortunate to be a part of for the last several years, um, as well as funding sources. And my contact information is available here if you have any follow-up questions. And I think there will be a few minutes after um, the Kegel's talk uh, now. Thank you very much.